I am Brad Schwartz. I'm professor and chairman of uh, urology at Southern Illinois University in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, it's an honor to be presenting to you. I wish we could have done this in person back in April, uh, but uh, world circumstances would not allow. I certainly hope you and your families and friends are, are very safe and uh, remain safe and cautious through this interesting time we're in. And uh, we'll go ahead and proceed with the uh, talk on medical uh, management and metabolic evaluation of, of stones. The overview of metabolic evaluation, uh, who gets tested, what tests do we order, and then we'll go through some of the management uh, of the various <clears throat> abnormalities that we might find. Um, the NHANES data shows a linear increased prevalence of stone disease uh, and that indeed the men and women, uh, the gap between men and women is narrowing. Uh, when I started this uh, 30 years ago, it was a roughly two to one um, ratio that we were looking at. Uh, stones do peak in the fourth to sixth decade, but as we know, they can occur in any age from zero to 100. Caucasian Americans have the greatest incidence, most likely because of their diets and their lack of exercise and their lack of dietary discretion. Um, and we do know that weight and BMI, BMI correlate with stone risk, probably more so in women than in men. This is just a picture of my operating room. I'm about to do a PCNL. And this is kind of the average scenario in my operating room. And what we can see is we obviously have a very large patient, uh, probably BMI of uh, whatever, uh, 50. Uh, however, the anesthesiologist is uh, certainly a healthy individual. Uh, our radiology technician um, has uh, certainly uh, contributed to uh, the national problem that we have. And when you even look at our nursing staff and the people preparing the patient, it really is a, a very ominous and kind of uh, widespread problem. So not only are the patients uh, being operated on obese, all the people taking care of them are obese as well. So what are the options for prevention? Let's say we do a ureteroscopy, we do a PCNL, and uh, we have the patients back and follow up when we're trying to counsel them uh, for stone prevention. We can give them general recommendations, which I'll go over, or we can do a formal metabolic evaluation, which this, this talk is really about. We have recurrence rates as high as 30% in three years and 50% in five years, and that data has really been uh, repetitive throughout uh, uh, many, many years. If a patient wishes to forego a, a, a proper formal uh, review, uh, then we have general recommendations, which we tell patients to uh, drink roughly two and a half liters per day. And that is not only necessarily just water. Uh, it really is any type of fluid. Um, <clears throat> patients should consume 100 to 125 ounces per day. They need to avoid about two and a half liters a day. Uh, and the best drink probably is lemonade. We tell them to eat or drink oral calcium. Oral calcium. We know that it decreases oxalate absorption. <clears throat> Whether it's supplements or dietary, uh, there have been a couple of studies to indicate it probably doesn't matter, but we think food is probably better absorbed and easily, more easily obtained. Calcium citrate is most likely better than calcium carbonate. And we tell patients to take these calcium supplements or calcium loads with meals, roughly 500 milligrams, two to three times per day. If they start taking a lot of calcium outside of the meal time, the oxalate then will still go unbound and it will still be absorbed. So it's important to tell them to take it with food. <clears throat> we also tell them to decrease sodium or salt intake. This decreases calcium excretion, as we know. We try to limit it to two or three grams per day, which on the American diet is virtually impossible. We also say uh, eat healthy. <clears throat> Diets rich in whole grains, uh, fruits and vegetables, low in saturated fats, decreased animal proteins, especially red meats, and increased omega-3 fatty acids are really the, the most promotable and uh, distinguished uh, ways we can do this for our patients. <clears throat> Maintain a healthy lifestyle. 
Hypertension and diabetes, especially diabetes and obesity, have been shown to uh, be correlated with stone disease. Exercise, uh, moderate alcohol consumption. And I think really just the, the message really is be balanced. The human body was meant to uh, enjoy a lot of different activities, uh, enjoy a lot of different foods and drinks. Um, and this is what we try to emphasize with the patient uh, to be balanced, limit um, carcinogens and, and things that are bad for you and maximize things that are good for you. So if they want a formal metabolic evaluation, uh, who do we uh, tend to uh, uh, test for this? Who do we offer it to? Well, we're guided a little bit by the AUA guidelines. And what they tell us is that recurrent calcium stone formers, children and adolescents, patients with a solitary kidney, any bowel disease, and in the United States, gastric bypass and gastric surgeries are very, very common. Patients with proven nephrocalcinosis by imaging, obesity, which that accounts for the vast majority of my patients, and really those who just wish to undergo formal testing. So the days of having one calcium stone that is passed spontaneously just to tell them come back as needed, I don't do that in my clinic. Uh, although in the guidelines, that is an option to just have routine imaging and uh, pr provide them with some dietary measures, I'd still offer virtually every patient who comes in my clinic with a stone formal metabolic evaluation. <clears throat> what do we order? Serum studies, basic metabolic panel, we're looking uh, mainly for an RTA or a hypokalemia. Uh, we're looking for renal failure, obviously, uh, and uh, glucose intolerance. We look for calcium, uric, and phosphorus, uh, calcium obviously being the most important, followed by uric acid. Uh, I do get vitamin D. It's somewhat controversial. There are some uh, articles and some literature that would suggest vitamin D levels are important at minimizing stone risk. Uh, however, too much vitamin D can be quite a problem in a lot of these patients. I order PTH only in specific circumstances, and that is if the serum calcium is elevated, or if I have a high index of suspicion with a lot of different stones over the years and uh, relatively middle-aged females who might be more prone to developing hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> urine studies, uh, a basic urinalysis analysis will reveal pH problems. So if we have a less than 5.5 pH spec uric acid, anything greater than 7.3, we look at infection uh, and, uh, and struvite stone formation. We can look for crystalluria, although <clears throat> only having oxalate, uh, calcium oxalate crystals in the urine is not necessarily a risk factor. Having something like cysteine crystals uh, in the urine uh, is uh, almost pathic mnemonic for a uh, disease. Urine culture is very important. If we have urease-splitting organisms, uh, the so-called three Ps, Proteus, Pseudomonas, and Providentia, but we know not E. coli uh, is, uh, is uh, in this group. <clears throat> so we look for a 24-hour urine. This is basically the cornerstone of, of stone prevention. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you feel how useful it is. Uh, as I age, I think I'm I'm gaining less trust in this test. Uh, I really don't know if we truly understand uh, what the 24-hour urine provides for us and gives us. Uh, I do repeat it regularly in my patients. Uh, my goal is to always have all green values, everything normal. Uh, and I still have patients who have green, uh, you know, completely normal 24-hour urines, and they're still developing stones periodically. I think we make a very, very large impact in diminishing stones or increasing the time between stone um, um, uh, 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 formations, um, but uh, I I'm not sure how much uh, value I, I have in it, and I think we really need something better and something different. So the total volume, as I mentioned, we shoot for a greater than two and a half liters per day. Uh, the pH can be a fairly wide value. Um, calcium, which is a negative impactor of stones, less than four milligram, milligrams per kilograms per day. 
Uh, again, if I have a, um, you know, a, 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 hun a, a hundred uh, and fifty kilogram person, I mean, that's six hundred milligrams a, a day, um, and so I'm not sure that that. You know, when we look at the weight, when we look at calcium requirements by weight, I'm not sure that's a great uh, indicator. We still have to keep these serum calcium, the urine calcium levels down. Urine sodium would like to have under 200, which in our American diet is virtually impossible. Uh, and oxalate levels, which we know in the gastric bypass population, can be very problematic. Uric acid, which is a negative impactor. Uh, as we know, we have different values for men and women. Um, citrate, which is a positive uh, indicator for stone prevention. We like to have over 360 or so. <clears throat> and then the creatinine, we have some rough measurements, whether the, the sample is a, a legitimate sample, uh, whether they poured water in it or, or they, did, they, they manipulated the specimen somehow. And then I'm not really sure we as a, a group know how to manage urinary sulfate, magnesium, and potassium. We feel magnesium is, a, is a, a stone inhibitor, but certainly in the face of citrate. So if you have a low citrate, uh, a lot of people will have a low magnesium, and uh, those two are, are somewhat tied together. Uh, a low uh, potassium also seems to be an inhibitor, and uh, sulfate seems to be a promoter. Uh, but when I look at them on the 24-hour urines, the vast majority of times they're fairly normal. So what are the abnormalities? Uh, 1995, Dr. Pack from UT Southwestern described classification, and, and quite frankly, I don't think these really have changed over uh, the years a great deal. Um, hypercalciuria, hypo, uh, hypocitraturia, hyperuricosuria, followed by some more. And then, you know, we really never talk about low volume, at least in my practice, that's probably the single most abnormal condition we find. And I'm not really sure that we really know if someone has a low volume, um, you know, how do we really counsel patients on the other parameters that are abnormal? And so in my practice, uh, as mentioned, it's the single most common abnormality we see. There's really not a tremendous amount of good data on urinary volume and its impact on stone disease. And at least for me, my experience has been, I've never seen literature on this, that when we see a low volume on a 24 hour urine, it is my opinion, my strong opinion, that we have to repeat the 24 hour urine again until the volume is normalized. And then you can counsel the patients on the true abnormalities that are unmasked by this volume. So if you have a volume of, of 800 cc's and they're low on citrate and high on oxalate, I feel it's very important to get that volume up over two and a half liters. And you know what? You might find that the citrate and oxalate actually normalize. And so on, when they're uvolemic, they actually have fairly normal parameters. <clears throat> so getting to hypercalcuria, we know that we have absorptive renal leak and hyperparathyroidism types one, two, and three. They all result in increased urinary calcium. A renal leak and hyperparathyroidism both result in hyperparathyroid hormone levels, but renal leak does this secondarily, and the hyperparathyroid or an adenoma will increase the serum PTH primarily. And this is the, the table that we're all accustomed to uh, with the absorptive. Um, again, uh, one of the first steps is to all these patients have hypercalcuria. So when you look at your serum calcium, if it's elevated, you pretty much have to really work them up for hyperparathyroidism. If the serum calcium is normal, uh, then you look at, you can look at parathyroid hormone, and if it's elevated, then that's a secondary hyperparathyroid uh, uh, hormone. And so you have uh, most likely a secondary uh, increase, which is due to a renal leak. Um, you can also do fasting or, or uh, calcium load, either one. Uh, and again, the absorptive, um, uh, the absorptive hypercalcuria will be normal when you give them a fasting uh, urinary calcium or a very low uh, calcium uh, diet. 
<clears throat> Essentially, the, if you find the hyperparathyroid patients, uh, there's a lot of literature to suggest that the other two, you just really need to treat with thiazides. Um, it does seem to be very effective, the combination therapy of potassium citrate and thiazide. Calcium stone formers uh, have an 80% remission with long-term therapy. Uh, and uh, there's some recent evidence, uh, I just reviewed a couple articles actually that would suggest that sodium citrate um, previously frequently avoided because of its risk of increasing uh, supersaturation of calcium phosphate. But sodium citrate in, in fairly low doses might actually be a very, very good um, surrogate for potassium citrate and it will do a very nice job without putting undue risk on calcium phosphate supersaturation. So that's something to, to consider um, is a, a, a teaspoon of sodium bicarb um, a couple times a day, two to three times a day, and it will have very, very little impact on uh, sodium and calcium uh, excretion. Stone formation rate uh, went from uh, almost three down to 0.05 per year with uh, regular thiazide therapy. Uh, again, this data is really fairly old, um, but it does seem to be durable. Um, and uh, basically you can find a thiazide, uh, find a diuretic that you like and get used to it and you can prescribe that one each time. Uh, what's the role of sodium with hypercalcuria? We know that um, sodium intake is a, is a major determinant of renal calcium excretion. Interestingly, if you increase your sodium intake by just 100 milliequivalents per day, that's not very much, your urinary calcium excretion will increase by 50 milligrams, which is pretty shocking uh, when you consider the effect that sodium has on calcium excretion. <clears throat> um, also, as we know, the, the urinary sodium, uh, high urinary sodium will block the actions of uh, the, di uh, the thiazide diuretics. The thiazides are the main mainstay of treatment. I typically try not to put a lot of my younger patients on thiazides because of uh, some of the other uh, potential side effects, um, but uh, they work uh, by augmenting calcium reabsorption in the distal tubule, uh, and it also blocks the activity of the sodium chloride channels. And again, side effects, uh, they have hypokalemia, hypocitraturia, uh, hyperuricosuria, and some hyperglycemia, not to mention some of the effects uh, of lipids. And that's why I don't really um, like to give my younger patients a lot of uh, di uh, diuretics. I really try to control a lot of their stone disease with diet uh, alone. Hyperoxaluria with our level of obesity and a lot of the surgeries to try to fix it. This is a, a real problem that we have here uh, in the United States. Um, the pathogenesis, uh, there's a primary hyperoxaluria. Uh, I'm not going to go into that a great deal. Uh, it's exceedingly rare. Um, we really don't have a great uh, treatment for it other than a, a massive transplant. I'll go over, I think I have one slide on this. We have dietary hyperoxaluria, which uh, includes excess dietary consumption, people who uh, overdose or uh, have mega doses of vitamin C, and then those who are on a low calcium diet. And that's very important because again, historically, a lot of non-urologists, a lot of primary care physicians, when they see patients with calcium stone disease, the first thing they tell their patients is to throw away all their milk, their yogurt, their ice cream, get rid of their calcium uh, supplementation, et cetera. Uh, and that's that's will probably affect at least 30% of our patients. Enteric hyperoxaluria uh, again is the one that we we have a lot of uh, problems with here: um, Crohn's and, and ulcerative colitis, uh, small bowel resection, bariatric surgery, um, and again this dietary calcium restriction problem. So hyperox primary hyperoxaluria is a congenital defect due to hepatic enzyme deficiencies. There's two types. It occurs at a very early age of onset. They, they all result in renal failure. And basically the only treatment option is a combined liver and kidney transplant. <clears throat> Oxalate pathways. Um, it's interesting. So of the 250 milligrams of, of dietary oxalate that we might consume, 
um, only about 10% of it or so is absorbed. The other 90% um, of it is, is eliminated in the GI tract. <clears throat> when you combine with that some of the intrinsic pathways that might produce 24 or 25 milligrams, um, <clears throat> Roughly 50 milligrams then combined uh, is available for a urinary excretion. Um, so, <clears throat> I, in my in my uh, practice, I don't necessarily go crazy on eliminating all oxalate foods because if only 10% of it is absorbed, I would like them to have their one spinach salad a week or have their bowl of blueberries or. Um, the rhubarb pie that they crave so much for dessert, uh, having that a couple times a week or enjoying that in moderation is probably not going to result in a huge amount of urinary oxalate. The, you get the exact same amount by intrinsic um, uh, formation. <clears throat> and so here's the list of the foods I just mentioned. Uh, spinach is the, the biggest culprit. I think they left off rhubarb on here. Um, but really just kind of the basic things that a lot of us eat and drink virtually every day, uh, trying to limit or eliminate these from one's diet is, is extremely difficult, especially here in the United States. <clears throat> so dietary hyperoxaluria, again, we, we try to at least talk to them about oxalate rich foods. Um, I'm not so absolutely obsessed with this, but I, I do mention it to them. Um, more commonly, it's actually from decreasing your calcium containing foods. And so I try to let them know to eat some type of calcium formulation, whether it's a, a yogurt, cottage cheese, uh, ice cream or milk, something like that with each meal. Uh, but we also have calcium citrate supplements that can be uh, given. Uh, even a lot of just uh, uh, nutritional vitamins that people take on a daily basis will have four or 500 milligrams of calcium. Enteric uh, hyperoxaluria, uh, we have uh, in the form of chronic diarrhea, bowel disease, bowel resection, gastric bypass surgery. These patients are extremely difficult to manage. Uh, it results in chronic diarrhea with fat malabsorption. Uh, we get excess fatty acids in the gut. Um, it, it, these fatty acids, they already uh, unfortunately bind the things that we don't want bound, then they bind the calcium, the calcium and magnet excuse me, the bind the calcium and magnesium resulting in saponification, uh, and then all this results in an increase of oxalate absorption from the gut. And the, this is almost an unavoidable uh, type of process in a lot of these patients. The chronic diarrheal uh, state also results in a reduced urine output. You get fluid losses from the intestinal tract. They get hypocitraturia, which then results in metabolic acidosis and hypokalemia. And again, with this hypocitraturia, like I mentioned before, the hypomagnesuria also uh, results in impaired intestinal magnesium absorption, which also might be uh, uh, cardiac, um, uh, might have an impact in the cardiac uh, environment. So we know magnesium uh, is important for heart health. And so now we're really starting to impact multi-systems really just by this one kind of chronic diarrheal uh, phase. What's the impact of bariatric surgery? Well, uh, Dr. Matlaga from Johns Hopkins looked at uh, the impact on basically new stone diagnosis, but also these patients undergoing surgical therapy. And uh, we can see that when you're obese with no surgery versus those patients undergoing a gastric bypass, the diagnosis of the stones and their need for surgical intervention uh, are considerably more. <clears throat> Hypocitraturia, uh, at least uh, by this study here, was the second most common found. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, it is uh, protective by its chelation of the calcium ions. It does help inhibit crystal nucleation. <clears throat> uh, it can be associated with the metabolic acidosis, both GI and in renal tubular acidosis, which at least in my region, is extremely uncommon. I've been here 17 years, and I've probably diagnosed uh, one or two patients with this RTA. Um, it is a type one, as we know. It has the inability to acidify urine, uh, which means that we are unable to dump the, the uh, 
acid ions into the urine. And so you get a hypokalemic, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. If you provide too much diuretic, too much thiazides, you might end up with a low urinary citrate, and you can just have an idiopathic or unknown type. What's the treatment for this? Well, we know dietary lemonade is very, very good for citrate. Orange juice less so, and remember orange juice will result in a unexpected urinary alkalinization. Lemonade does not impact pH. Medical therapy such as potassium citrate, we can give 20 milli equivalents BID to TID. We can get slow release tabs, which are very good. It can result in GI upset. In patients with renal insufficiency, maybe attenuate your dose a little bit. If the pills, which are very large and can be poorly tolerated, there are liquid and powder forms of this agent which can be used. And again, I think sodium citrate has always been a neglected stepchild in all this, and maybe it might be time to start thinking about it. In the United States, actually, potassium citrate is fairly expensive as well. So we try to look for other ways. And sodium citrate, sodium bicarb, et cetera, very, very cheap. It might increase urinary sodium, but quite frankly, the studies that have been recently emerging would indicate that they don't really affect urinary calcium excretion that much at all. As mentioned, the potassium citrate raises urinary pH, and so you might want to try to consider self-monitoring the pH, make sure they don't get too high. It does, for RTA patients, it does correct the metabolic acidosis. And again, with the increased pH, you might increase the risk of supersaturation of calcium phosphate stones. So pH regulation is very, very important, either through auto, sorry, self-testing or through formal 24-hour urine. And remember that lemonade does increase the citrate very, very nicely, but it does not have an effect on pH. Hyperuricosuria, somewhat common in the United States. We mainly care about the urine uric acid because it's what increases calcium oxalate formation. The diet, if we decrease dietary animal protein, which reduces the purine load, then we can try to decrease the urinary uric acid through diet. If you want medical therapy, then potassium citrate and allopurinol can be very, very effective. In uric acid stones, most uric acid stone formers have a normal urinary uric acid. We try to find out what the underlying factor, but the vast majority is going to be acidic urine, a very low urine pH. It's typically idiopathic, but recent indications would find that type 2 diabetes is perhaps a profound, has a profound impact on these patients. So again, most uric acid stone formers have a normal urinary uric acid. The underlying really, the underlying risk factor is low urine pH. If we treat the low urine pH with a potassium citrate, we look for a target of six to six and a half. At this time, even in the AUA guidelines, allopurinol is rarely used in these patients. It's really, again, a pH problem, not necessarily a uric acid problem. And so I only use allopurinol in patients whose serum uric acid is elevated, or if they have a predominant calcium stone with a increased urinary uric acid. But with pH problems, allopurinol probably has very little impact. Lastly, infection stones. We know that struvite stones often result in staghorn appearing stones. The urine pH is typically greater than 7.3 or 7.5. 
And it's produced by these types of bacteria, not E. coli. The AUA guidelines would suggest a couple of things. You need to have complete elimination through surgery. So if we have a strong indication that a patient has a struvite stone, ESWL may not be the best treatment. We need to probably do percutaneous surgery for the larger ones to assure stone clearance and stone-free status as shown by CT scan. We need to monitor and prevent recurrent infections. And again, by guideline, three months of post-operative antibiotics are suggested. In my practice, I use Cipro, somewhat low dose, whether it's 250 BID or 500 once a day for three months. And then lithostat or acetohydroxamic acid is a very rarely used medication. It has lots of side effects. You cannot use it for patients with an elevated creatinine. And it really does have a lot of collateral damage. So just exercise caution if you use this. And I would really only entertain it after all surgical options have been exhausted in patients. The cysteine stones, autosomal recessive, it's due to the transportation of dibasic amino acids to the cola. Usually large stone volume at a young age. A lot of these teenagers are getting four or five percutaneous procedures already. I literally just did a 19-year-old bilateral cysteine perk, bilateral perk on a cysteine patient last week. And this is the fourth time I've operated on him at the age of 19. He is an extremely noncompliant, just doesn't care about things and would rather undergo surgery than take medication. We know that there's the autosomal dominant recessive gene. And over 250 milligrams excretion probably represents the true disease. This is the young 19-year-old who I just did the perks on last week. And the center picture actually shows the post-op CT being stone-free on follow-up. Objective of treatment is to reduce the concentration below the solubility. We want the diet to increase fluids and really restrict sodium and protein. These are the patients who I have, they need to get up in the middle of the night to urinate because they're fluid heavy. And before they go back to sleep again, they have an eight ounce glass of water sitting on their nightstand that before they lie back down, they're going to drink another glass of water. We try to alkalinize the urine. So we aim for a pH of about 7.5 or so. And the mainstay of treatment, at least in my opinion, is really the alpha mercaptopropanil glycine or thiola. You can use the D-penicillamine, but its side effect profile is prohibitive in many patients. And the thiola is nice because you can really titrate it. There's a lot of flexibility in titrating the medication. You can keep ordering the 24-hour cysteine volume or concentration. And you can really fine tune these patients so that they're doing pretty well. And it does work very well. It basically severs the trisulfide bond and makes it into the poorly soluble cysteine dimer. These are much more soluble than the trisulfide cysteine molecule. The side effects can be significant and actually make them stop taking the medication, but they're still much less than D-penicillamine. The manufacturer has just eased up a little bit on testing their blood a lot. And so the CBC and LFT monitoring that we do is much less frequent at this point. You should at least get a urine for protein probably on a monthly or a couple month basis to make sure that renal preservation is not deteriorating. So what do the guidelines tell us as far as follow-up for these patients? 
I do repeat 24 hour urine every three to four months uh, for, for the big ones. And then if there's only one or two abnormalities, uh, I will get it every six months until it becomes normal. Once their 24 hour urine is all completely normal, I repeat it once a year and I try to maintain um, a lot of enthusiasm and, and uh, attaboys to the patients to make sure they're doing a good job. Um, you can obtain labs as indicated to assess for adverse effects uh, of the pharmacotherapy that you institute. Um, I do repeat stone analyses on all the stones because we know that the compositions can change over time. And again, I obtain repeat imaging every year on these patients. I get a renal ultrasound on virtually every stone patient I have to monitor their stone patients and make sure that we're still doing okay. These are all AUA guidelines. The stone medications that we, uh, we, we use, uh, again, potassium citrate, we now possibly might be able to use sodium, uh, bicarb, thiazide, just pick one, get used to it. There's uh, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, there's indapamide, there's chlorothalidone. Uh, those are the ones in the United States. Obviously, worldwide, there are many, many to choose from. Uh, just try to make sure you check the potassium uh, periodically uh, and repeat their 24-hour urines to make sure uh, it's having a, an effect. Um, and then allopurinol for bad hyperuricosuria, but not necessarily um, uh, uric acid. Hello, uh, Dr. Schwartz, again, i um, talk to you about uh, ureteroscopy versus PCNL. Uh, I kind of threw in uh, that we're using, uh, um, and so, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to talk with you and uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. So I just threw up, I had a patient uh, a couple months ago, it's what, what's the optimal treatment for a lower pole, 10 to 15 millimeter stone. Uh, I had a 58 year old uh, African American woman with left flank pain, uh, no red herrings, uh, no, uh, no tricks, uh, just the normal anatomy and basically just a lower pole stone. She does have this renal cyst uh, that's there, but uh, it's benign. Um, and uh, we see the measurements, it's about 10 by six. It had about 950 Hounsfield units. Um, and so what do the AUA guidelines tell us about a stone like this? Um, it it uh, can be a PCNL, retrograde uh, ureteroscopy, or lithotripsy. So for this type of stone, all three uh, are within the guidelines. Randomized trials would indicate that these types of stones uh, are better served by PCNL if you want single treatment stone free rates, but they are associated with greater morbidity. <clears throat> the European uh, guidelines uh, would really indicate virtually the exact same thing. Uh, they recommend either uh, endourology, which is a, a PERC or ureteroscopy, or a lithotripsy, and perhaps lithotripsy for a lower pole, 10 to 15 millimeter stone is, is gonna yield lower res, uh, results. <clears throat> the guidelines, again, the PCNL should be considered the primary treatment for most cases. Um, PCNL with smaller access sheaths, such as the mini or micro perks, these may allow for similar outcomes uh, maybe with lower complication rates, although the, the mini PCNL, um, uh, some of the studies would indicate the complication rates are, are not that dissimilar. But what about in 2020? Remember these guidelines are from several years ago and they've not, the, the stone guidelines have not necessarily been updated. Uh, and in 2020, we have a lot of different toys and, and uh, technologies that might uh, make it different. Uh, one of them are single use scopes. Uh, why would that even come into play? Because we have better flexion, excellent vision, and they're new every time. And so if we have a lower pole stone like we just presented, and we know we have a flexible ureteroscope that's reusable, and it has somewhat uh, been used, and we can't get the proper flexion that we need, uh, we're gonna be running the laser fiber down through there, uh, through a bent scope. Um, we might injure the scope. We, we don't wanna break the scope, and so we're less inclined to go down there. We might have to take a basket and relocate the stone to a better location. Well, now you're spending a lot of money on a, on a basket to do that. So single use scopes may 
have an impact on the results and the overall usage of retrograde intrarenal surgery for this type of stone. And furthermore, the thulium fiber laser, which I'll go into a lot more, it's a high watt with ultra high frequency capabilities, has much smaller fibers that are possible. Dusting capabilities seem to be better. The stone does not move at all, and the footprint is really quite acceptable. I'm going to go over some of the single use scopes that we at least have here in the United States, and I'll show you images from every single one of them so you can just kind of see what we're looking at when we use them. The newest one on the market is the by Dornier, it's Axis. Poussin, a Chinese company, has the use scope, which is available here in the United States. The Neoflex Neoscope, I've actually not seen. I couldn't find any images for it, but I'll show you the scope. Boston Scientific is the first to market, at least here in the West, in the form of Lithaview. And Bard acquired technology from another company, and they are marketing theirs as the Wii scope. I'm not sure who actually manufactures that one, but they're the ones who brand. So essentially, the disposable scopes are all very, very similar. They're all extremely light. For those of you who've used them, you know that they have this really kind of a cheap feel to them, but they're disposable. You use them for whatever, use them for 30 minutes or for three hours, and they're done, and you throw them away. They have almost all, almost all have identical specifications with a couple little bells and whistles. The digital views that we get with them are really phenomenal. I think you should really pick one and use it and be familiar with it. I will tell you that the competition in the United States has become a good thing, and we're actually on the verge of getting a couple more single-use ureteroscopes on the market from other companies. And the price has come down. The price, the initial opening price of the Lithaview compared to what all of the scopes are now offering is about 50 percent of when they came on the market. So I think with increased competition, that's a great thing. It will make, it will force the companies to have better technology and really get the price down where it becomes a very nice adjunct to a lot of our operating rooms. The thulium fiber laser, it's highly absorbed by water. It runs at 1940 nanometers. You can generate frequencies up to 2400 hertz with this thing. It's really amazing. I was involved in some of the very early animal trials that we, that the company was doing. So I really got to see the unit in its infancy. Fibers as small as 150 microns are currently available, but the technology will allow fibers that even as what type of stone fragmentation you, the small footprint, how it sits in our operating room. This is the device right here. This is it. It literally sits on top of this cart to compare it. This is a, these two are video dashboard. You can pick what type of stone fragmentation you want, whether it's dusting, fragmenting a bladder stone. You can do fine dusting. And then when it's on, this is, it has two pedals. So you can plug two settings in at once and just go from your left pedal to your right pedal if you need to. And again, this is just an example. We were, today we were doing a dusting of a stone and doing a frequency of 200 hertz at 0.05 joules with a resulting power of 10 watts. And that just gives you an idea of what we're capable of doing. So this is a, I kind of, this is a cell phone picture, but I wanted both of them in view at the same time. And you're just looking here at what kind of view you get with a single use scope. And you can see that the movement of the stone is probably not as great as a true popcorn. And this is the setting of 200 and 0.05. Here's a ureteral stone that we did. And again, at least at the beginning right here, the stone is really just not even moving at all. 
And even when we kind of break the, 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 the crystallization plane, uh, it still doesn't really move that much um, uh, when you deploy the energy. So uh, again, I think uh, the thulium is, is a great adjunct. Uh, <clears throat> um, there aren't necessarily a lot of head-to-head -head trials uh, uh, with other lasers, but I think um, it, the, what literature is available would indicate that these stones can probably be treated faster. Uh, there is less uh, motion of the stones, uh, less re retropulsion, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a nice adjunct to our stone treatment. So if you compare that to the PCNL, so if we go back to our original case, and we're trying to counsel this uh, woman about, uh, okay, we want to do ureteroscopy or do we want to do um, PCNL? Well, what kind of PCNL? Sorry, I didn't understand. What kind of PCNL uh, do we do? Uh, we can do a standard, we can do a mini, we can do an ultra mini, we can do a super mini. We can do a mini micro, we can do a micro. And now I'm waiting for the micro mini super ultra mini. Uh, which would be absolutely fantastic. We could have something that's one French and it basically just dissolves stones uh, by virtue of going into the kidney. Um, <clears throat> the standard, uh, as we're all familiar with, is a, is a larger uh, percutaneous uh, approach. Um, it has very high stone clearance uh, by virtually every study. Uh, the blood transfusion, we actually went out as a fellow, we actually uh, uh, published our transfusion rates of about four to 6%. And this was back in the 1990s. Uh, most studies now would indicate that a standard perk has really been brought down immensely down to one to 2%. So the blood transfusion and the blood loss for these standard perks is still really not that great. Um, and it does have slightly higher complication rate. Um, pain, I think is still an issue. Uh, I do a lot of a lot of upper pole, and if we do a standard perk upper pole, uh, we're usually going over a rib, and so um, overnight these patients are a little bit uh, uncomfortable. But uh, the way we do our perks, we get all of our tubes out the next day, um, so it's a hospital stay with a one night stay, um, and uh, the stone clearance is is really fantastic. <clears throat> Would a standard perk be great for this, you know, 10 to 12 millimeter lower pole stone? I, I don't know. That's a little bit. A little bit much, I think. Um, so let's look at the mini perk. We can do a 14 to 20 French uh, mini perk. There's a lot of kits out there that are already made. They're pre-made by, by manufacturing um, and by companies who are out there. Um, stone clearance seems to be a little bit lower. Uh, blood transfusion is minimal. Uh, interestingly, when you look at the complication rate, um, it, it, they're not that dissimilar to the standard perk. And so uh, as far as transfusion and blood loss, I think it's definitely better. Um, pain is probably better. I think if you go above the, the rib, uh, I think you're still going to be left with a little bit of um, uh, pain from these. And so uh, I think the mini perk is very good. You also have to get used to, uh, you know, when you put the laser fiber in or whatever lithotrite you're going to use, you have to get used to breaking the stone up and trying to um, have the effect where the stones can drain out of the tube since suction is at a very limited capacity. <clears throat> Ultra mini, super mini, uh, mini micro. Again, there, there's, there's a fair amount of data, virtually all of it from uh, Asia. And um, it, the results seem to be pretty good. Uh, and I, I guess my question is, is smaller better? Um, I would advise you to pick a procedure and become good at it. Um, but one problem I have with a lot of the data that's being presented with these is that very rarely are their results being confirmed with a CT scan. So virtually all of their stone free calculations involve ultrasound or KUB. We know very clearly that CT is the gold standard for determining um, stone fragments and success of these. And so I would argue that when you want to really look at these for success, you have to do a CT scan on your patients to assure that they're stone free in the end. Um, <clears throat> so what did we do? We have all this new technology. We have uh, 58 different ty types of percutaneous procedures available. 
Well, we went ahead and just did the um, ureteroscopy. She had a uh, actually a little uh, area where the stone uh, was kind of in, in a, either a scarred infundibulum or something like that. The stone was right behind there. Uh, but we kind of broke in. We got a wire in and just uh, put the scope in over and uh, used the thulium, and we just kind of melted it away. Uh, and she did fantastic. We did a CT scan. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, this is the end. The end product of the uh, the uh, uh, in that little cavity. We just started dusting the remnants. You can see really uh, it's a, a really good effect with a good vision. <clears throat> um, a CT scan a month later uh, after that procedure uh, demonstrated uh, her to be stone free. Uh, so I think it was the right option. It was the right pick. Uh, I think in general, URS versus PCNL, it, it's going to be a debate and an argument that will go on for a long, long time, especially since we keep getting newer, better technology in both of the, in both of the, tech, uh, the procedures. So I, I would suggest to you get good at a procedure, maybe get good at two or three procedures. You just have to keep doing them and keep getting better at them. Stick with it, but you also have to be aware of new technology coming out. If you love a laser and you think the laser is great and then suddenly a new laser technology comes on board, you really got to try it, maybe use it several times, see if it's better than what you have uh, and stay up on the new technology, but always have a goal, at least in my opinion. Um, I've had three stones and I've had two ureteroscopies for stones, so I know what stone free means. Um, have a goal of being making these patients stone free. And if you have that goal in mind, then you will almost always use the best technology and the best technique to get them that way. Hello, uh, Dr. Schwartz, uh, gonna talk to you about um, stone treatment in odd situations. Uh, we're gonna discuss three, uh, three situations, renal ectopy, a pregnancy, and urinary diversions. Um, renal ectopy is probably about one in a thousand when you really look at uh, widespread uh, incidents. Horseshoe is much more common, one in 400. The renal pelvis and, uh, and UPJ are, are uh, always anterior, superior, and a little bit more lateral than we might think compared to the normal kidney. For the horseshoe uh, and, and uh, virtually, uh, and for the horseshoe and the, the pelvic kidney and some of the fusion anomalies, a high insertion uh, is very, very common. When you have the high insertion and the renal pelvis and UPJ in these anatomic locations, retrograde entry uh, and thorough calocele evaluation can be difficult, especially when you try to get up into the horseshoe kidney uh, and then down into the lower pole. And when you look at this uh, specimen here, uh, if you can just picture taking the, the scope uh, up into uh, the UPJ and then having to bring down uh, uh, really a, a 180 degrees uh, trying to get access into the lower poles, that's where it's going to be very difficult in doing retrograde intrarenal surgery for a lot of these uh, ectopic kidneys. <clears throat> um, for the horseshoe kidney, uh, ureteroscopy seems best for potentially smaller stones. Uh, certainly stones that are outside of the lower pole, so whether they're upper pole or renal pelvis. Um, again, the UPJ has a very difficult angle and it can be difficult to access the renal pelvis and the lower poles. <clears throat> the ureteroscopy results uh, are, are somewhat difficult to interpret. Uh, when you review the articles and you, and you look at widespread um, literature, uh, there's really no uniform definition of, of stone free or, or quote success and doing the horseshoe kidney I think is even more difficult because uh, very few of these articles are uh, the success is never really assessed by CT imaging postoperatively. Um, if you can get into the kidney with ureteroscopy and you want to dust the stone uh, the, the majority of reports would suggest that you can get a 50 to 70 percent success rate. The biggest problem is that when you dust these, they typically will 
fall down and, and um, uh, coalesce into that lower pole. And that's where it's extremely difficult. You're never going to get clearance of that stone in the lower pole based on the anatomical configuration of the horseshoe or the, the pelvic kidney. If you can basket these stones, uh, keep in mind it may be very, very difficult to get that basket with a stone in it past the UPJ because of that angulation going into the renal pelvis. So it, to me, it, it's always made a lot more sense to address horseshoe kidney stones with a PCNL. These are almost always upper pole puncture. Uh, they're uh, almost always inferior to the lung field because the kidney is so uh, uh, low uh, in the uh, abdomen. Uh, and the relationship to ribs is, is quite variable, but you're almost always even going uh, underneath the 12th rib. <clears throat> in obese patients, you sometimes run out of room because if you're trying to get that scope down to the lower pole, uh, it, it really it, it can be difficult. Uh, therefore, we always use a flexible cystoscope to interrogate all the calyces. Uh, what I call it is, is kind of sliding downhill or sledding downhill. Uh, and when you're in the upper pole and you want to get down to the lower, it's just a constant you know, bent, bounce and, and bump up and down to get down to that lower pole. And then you may need to even go down a little bit further inferiorly to get to the true dependent calyx. Uh, the UPJ can be difficult to identify. You, you, you actually normally will just zoom right past it on the way to the lower pole and you may not even see it. Um, if you place a ureteral catheter beforehand, you can certainly inject um, contrast or uh, you know, methylene blue or, or something like that to identify where the, uh, ureteral, uh, where the UPJ opening is. <clears throat> Um, PCNL results, uh, I, I would say again, they're difficult to interpret uh, because there is no uh, uniform definition. Um, according to the literature, they're much higher than ureteroscopy. They're going to result in greater than 80% success rates uh, uh, of being stone free. And the complication rates are really not that different than a uh, normal kidney. I would say that lung complications and solid organ complications are considerably less. Uh, transfusion rate should be the same, uh, and um, uh, UTI or persistent leak or things like that are, are uh, typically the same. What I will say is that if it's a fairly large stone and you have to do a lot of work in that kidney, postoperatively, the nephrostomy tube may not drain as well as a normal kidney uh, in a higher percentage of cases. Uh, just because of that anatomy and the edema and inflammation that occurs. So I do counsel these patients that they will have a nephrostomy tube in perhaps a little bit longer, uh, or we can place a stent and just keep a stent in, but I typically like to leave the nephrostomy tube in for uh, perhaps five to seven days if it does not drain the next day on our routine nephrostogram. <clears throat> so this is uh, the, the horseshoe kidney. Um, the arrow depicts the location where I would typically get access and go in. This, this particular one appears to be right at the 12th rib. Um, so we would either uh, provide a little bit of inspiration and get that uh, kidney down underneath the rib and then puncture, uh, or just go a little bit above the rib and just get access into, at an angle, uh, get access into that upper pole puncture. But you can really see uh, on here I mean, if you're going to take a ureteroscope and go up this ureter here and get in, then to get down here into the lower pole, and this isn't just a, um, a turn medial. This is going to be medial and then uh, posterior, and most likely, uh, yeah, sorry, a, a posterior or anterior. It could be either one. And again, likewise, on this one, when you're going up here and your scope enters the kidney at about this level, you're gonna to have to make this turn going all the way down and then back up to find out if there are any stones in that. When you do a perk, your scope is gonna come in and you're basically just gonna take the flexible scope and you're just gonna come all the way down. You're gonna be able to survey calyx, 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 calyx. Uh, and that's why I always really try to prefer uh, percutaneous access or, or a percutaneous approach 
uh, for horseshoe kidneys. <clears throat> what about an ectopic kidney other than um, horseshoe? Uh, again, I think all of these are options. The one that we added here would be a lap-assisted PCNL or a lap and robot uh, type of approach. Um, and open. Um, uh, I've done several open procedures in the last several years and uh, uh, all but one of them were on ectopic kidneys. Again, in the pelvic kidney, please remember that the uh, renal pelvis is anterior. Uh, it's almost uh, midline in, in many, many cases. It is surrounded by important structures. It lives in a bad neighborhood. There's uh, the, the iliac vessels, there's bowel, um, there are neural plexus, uh, the, the sacral promontory uh, lies close by with some of its uh, surrounding structures. And so you, you really are gonna be operating in a somewhat difficult area. If you're trying to address these uh, percutaneously, but laparoscopically assisted, uh, you're gonna have to move intestine out of the way or move the bowel out of the way uh, to dilate through uh, that. Uh, and the vascularity of these kidneys is really highly variable. <clears throat> this is a, a schematic, uh, just looking at uh, a, a right-sided uh, ectopic kidney. Um, and you can see uh, the renal pelvis is again, very uh, anterior uh, and uh, superiorly located. You can just imagine or picture uh, your reteroscope going up here and then possibly going down to the lower pole, it's extremely different, uh, difficult uh, to get any stone-free status of that lower pole. Uh, the left lower quadrant pain, I did an open pile of lithotomy on him eight years uh, prior. This was after a failed laparoscopic assisted percutaneous approach. Uh, when I got in there, I, I just did not have enough um, uh, uh, supporting structure to dilate over and I could not get a sheath into his renal pelvis. Um, but it, he presented again with hematuria, uh, had uh, this uh, large stone that reformed in eight years. Um, and so we ended up doing a, an open uh, pyelolithotomy on him. Uh, and again, the, the uh, kidney, I, I would go back to this picture here, that this is identical to what you find surgically that the vessels are coming right over into the renal pelvis. Uh, the renal pelvis is just literally sitting straight up in the air. You have to do very little dissection laterally, uh, medially. You don't have to dissect the kidney out at all. Um, you really just need to, to try to find the renal pelvis. It'll be encased in, in some scar and, and in a little bit of uh, 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 connective tissue that's surrounding the kidney. Uh, but once you find the pelvis, uh, you can incise and, and kind of do these uh, open uh, pyelolithotomies uh, uh, that we uh, that we can do. Um, I think that <clears throat> pelvic kidney options uh, for lithotripsy, I would suggest no. There's way too much uh, structure in the way. I suppose you can do them prone. You do risk uh, bowel uh, bruising or bowel injury with the with the lithotripsy. Uh, you cannot lay them supine because of the bony structures. Uh, ureteroscopy, maybe. Uh, the angle used to enter the kidney and lower pole would be very, very difficult to assure stone clearance. Uh, the perk and lap assisted perk, I say possibly. I think if you can try to get uh, a lot of uh, purchase and, and back support to get the sheath in. Uh, but in my hands, uh, in my experience, unfortunately, a lot of these pelvic kidneys will be. Uh, uh, opened and um, uh, addressed with an open surgery. <clears throat> Stones in pregnancy, uh, the risk of the fetus of ionized and radi radiation, analgesics, antibiotics, sure, sure. and anesthesia. Uh, this was a, a CT scan that I obtained. Uh, uh, this was a, a CT scan that I obtained. Uh, uh, sorry, that, 
that we were sent, uh, we were sent this patient with a CT scan, uh, and you can just see the, the impressive nature of doing a CT in a pregnant patient. Uh, here we have a little bit of left hydronephrosis. Uh, there's a stone at the UPJ, and then, oh yeah, and there uh, happens to be a, a, a developing fetus. This was a fairly, fairly late um, uh, in her pregnancy. I believe it was about 30 weeks. Um, so one could argue that at 30 weeks, an ultra low dose CT may not be that harmful. Um, I literally was just sent this patient uh, literally yesterday, uh, sent by an outside urologist. And again, um, we see, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is uh, a um, video of the CT uh, with um, some <clears throat> Uh, right-sided hydronephrosis. And so as I play this and move it back and forth, we can see the hydronephrosis on the right. Here's the ureter. And as we move and follow that ureter down, um, it is uh, continued to be dilated. And it continues to be dilated posterior to the developing fetus. This fetus, by the way, this lady, a 29-year-old lady is 23 weeks pregnant. Um, I don't think I would have ordered the CT, but uh, it was given to us. Um, and so we go down and we can see a roughly two to three millimeter, very vague <laughs> hyperdensity. But the radiologist is calling a stone, but the urologist in the remote area stented her. <clears throat> and uh, now we have uh, this to deal with. And our plan is actually today to, to do a ureteroscopy make sure she's stone free and uh, get all stents and tubes out because she's miserable. She was actually sent to us because of recalcitrant pain. Um, but doing CT in pregnancy is certainly uh, probably not recommended, um, certainly not in the first two trimesters. <clears throat> what the guidelines tell us is that we need to coordinate all treatment with OB. Uh, these patients need to have fetal monitoring uh, there is a period of observation that is absolutely mandatory before we intervene. And if they fail observation, you can use a stent and nephrostomy tube. They both easily calcify requiring frequent changes. Ureteroscopy is probably safe, and there are a number of, of studies to suggest that it can be used. What I'm not sure of are the effects of laser on the developing auditory canal. And so hearing and laser use is not known. Um, but again, fetal monitoring, I think, is crucial when you do these cases. <clears throat> Remember that all these patients have, um, uh, almost all of them have hydronephrosis and pain. The hydronephrosis is really from the progesterone effect. It's a hormonal effect on the ureteral uh, muscle. And so hydronephrosis does not mean anything in pregnancy. Um, the vast majority are observed, some are stented, Fewer get nephrostomy tubes, and even fewer seem to have get ureteroscopy. And almost all of those are easily uh, uh, treated distal stones with no laser. Um, the one I'm going to treat is a proximal or proximal mid, but it's so small that I, I just want to get this lady stent-free and urology-free uh, so we can concentrate on her pregnancy. <clears throat> Urinary diversions, if you look at the... There are not a lot of AUA guidelines on diversions uh, in the stone section. Uh, the, a the EAU guidelines uh, have a couple of uh, entries. And uh, uh, one of the biggest th comments that they make is that the recurrence rates are extremely high. Uh, at five years, 63% who uh, needed treatment will go on to get another treatment. And so uh, that's basically a 63% five-year not recurrence rate, but retreatment rate, which is pretty alarming in these patients. The conduits and ureters uh, uh, may be long and convoluted, making retrograde access very difficult. Continent diversions, the retrograde access is very, very difficult. Um, and so uh, the vast majority of these are uh, addressed percutaneously. 
And indeed, when you look at the guidelines and what the summaries of the guidelines are, they say word for word, the choice of the access depends upon the feasibility of the orifice identification. And whenever a retrograde approach is not feasible, then proceed with percutaneous access. And when you look at a strong rating on the strength of recommendation, perform percutaneous stones to remove large stones, as well as for ureteral stones, it cannot be accessed via a retrograde approach. Even ESWL certainly is a viable option. The problem is if you get Steinstrasse with them, you're automatically going to have percutaneous drainage because getting into those would be extremely difficult. So how do we follow up patients with a diversion? They do have high recurrence rates. So a metabolic evaluation might be helpful. Many of these are infection stones. So trying to take care of the diversion and drainage and bacterial control might be helpful. They need hydration of 100 ounces to a gallon of fluid a day. And again, as I do for every other stone patient, I get annual imaging and I do it with ultrasound. It will look for hydronephrosis. It will look for stones, at least kidney and maybe proximal ureteral stones for follow-up. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Be safe and keep your family safe. And I look forward to seeing you.